Good evening. In this episode of Stalin's life, we will cover we will cover the development of Stalin's political activity from his living the seminary up to the victory in of the October Revolution in 18, 1917. Most of Stalin's first period of political activity took place took place in a triangle that comprises the city of Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, Batumi, the Georgian port on the Black Sea, and Baku, or Baku, the Baku, the bustling, a bustling city on the Caspian Sea, in today's Azerbaijan. Baku was a kind of Russian-style California gold rush town, where the gold was oil. The Rothschilds, believe it or not, were the first to begin exploiting the commodity, and Stalin even said or express pride, jokingly, at having worked for the Rothschilds at one time. But let's go in order. There was a socialist party in Georgia in the last decade of the 19th century. It had been founded by another seminarist. He had been dismissed from the seminary for having, for having beaten up the rector. And there were also associations of semi-revolutionary Russian workers who gathered in Tiflis. Now, Stalin started frequenting these circles while he was still in the seminary. And he believed in a kind of blend of Marxism and Georgian nationalism and was eventually expelled from the seminary for revolutionary, for revolutionary activities. His first job was as a weatherman at the Tiflis Observatory. And his first, let us say, political act of resistance was the organization of the May Day Parade in the year 1900. May Day, as you know, being the Christmas Day of Socialism. Aware of the sense of unease among the populace, the imperial government had set up an impressive secret police called the Okrana, which stands for Division for the Protection of Order and Social Security. They knew that a revolutionary terrorist movement was growing, and they, of course, arrested terrorists. Still, in 1881, the revolutionary terrorist group called the People's Will assassinated the Emperor Alexander II. And in Tiflis, in the year 1900, they tried to unsuccessfully uh, to arrest Stalin. Now, 1900 for Stalin marks the beginning of a life that took inspiration from a booklet written by a nihilist Nekaev, or Nekaev called Revolutionary Catechism. A life where, to quote from the book, all tender feelings for family, friendship, love, gratitude, and even honor must be squashed by the sole passion for revolutionary work. We can say that both Lenin and Stalin were a product of the thoughts contained in this pamphlet. For the revolutionaries, the Okrana's most common punishment was, was called administrative exile, often, or rather usually, in remote and almost inaccessible corner of Siberia. They reserved execution only for conspiracies or attempts on the life of the Tsar. And in fact, uh, Lenin's brother, the young Alexander Ulyanov, or Ulyanov, was caught in one such conspiracy to kill the Tsar and was executed. And this is said what radicalized Lenin in turn. This Okrana, or national security, was a massive organization and without, at the time, of course, any electronic help was laden, as we can imagine, with a mountain of information and reports coming from all over the country, much in the same way as it happens with the metadata today collected by the U.S. contemporary Okrana, there was no way to collect all the information in a usable way, partly because of this mass of, of unorganized, unorganized uh, collected data, and, also, and although Sp Stalin spent eight years in in, in various exile in Siberia and, and every, elsewhere, he was also, because of this, he was also successful in evading capture through various disguises and strokes and strokes of luck. One of the tactics of the, Ogra, of, of the Okrana, if I remember how to pronounce it, was to plant double agents in socialist organizations. And sometimes these double agents work their way up through the socialist ladder, if you like, organization, while none of the members were aware of it. And such was the case, for example, of the double agent Malinovsky, who acquired key position inside the Bolshevik movement until the breakout of the 1917 revolution. Now, as we know, revolutions cannot be made with the help of the police and without money. 
money required for printing, for promotion, for travel, for initiatives, for meeting, for congresses, for demonstration, and everything else. And this was a challenge in Georgia as well for Stalin and for his associates. Stalin and his colleagues resolved the problem mainly in two ways. One with bank robberies, which they renamed appropriately expropriations, and one with protections, mafia style, to make it, to make it short. Some of the bank robberies turned deadly. One of the most famous ones was the Tiflis bank robbery in 19, 1907, carried out by assault in the stagecoach that transported cash to the main bank of Georgia. There were 14 pe 40 people killed and 50 injured. The heist was about three to equivalent to $3.7 million. However, the largest banknotes were marked, and so most of the money could not be used, and there were a number of arrests throughout Europe where the larger notes were, were attempted to be cashed. This type of activity had already caused a split, uh, to split, or rather in the Bolshevik leadership, those who were, for, who were in favor and those who were against these methods. And the majority was against it, but it was too late to prevent the Tiflis robbery. And as we are talking about splits, this is the time to introduce another split in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which had been founded in 1898 to, to unite the many revolutionary organizations in Russia into one party. In 1903, two factions arose inside it, two names of, of one of which is familiar to many as it became a derogatory synonym for communism, namely the Bolsheviks. The other, the other faction corresponding, corres corresponded, were called, corresponding faction was called the Mensheviks. Bolsheviks means the, major the majority, while Mensheviks means the minority. Ironically, until the, the revolution of October 1917, the Menshevik, the, this, the minority, was the majority, and the Bolsheviks were the minority, but let that go. The important point is that there was a consorted effort among the, all the revolutionary organizations in Russia to, to collect enough funds to fuel the revolution that eventually, as you know, exploded in 1917. In this process, and through rocambolesque, rocambolesque adventures, narrow escapes, imprisonment, love affairs and exiles, Stalin was to become a protagonist. We must choose arbitrarily just a few events to show the type of life Stalin led during this turbulent pre-revolutionary pre period. But I hope they are sufficient to give you an idea of the times and of the man. In 1901, Stalin moved to Batumi, where in the Black Sea, where he intended to bring a more aggressive spirit to the local revolutionaries. Batumi was a mixture of Persian, Turkish, Greek, Georgian, Armenian, and Russian workers employed in the refineries controlled by the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds had built a pipeline from Baku on the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea. Workers, their families and their children lived miserably in foul streets with their non-existent sewage systems, dirty air and dirty air from the refineries. Many died of typhus, but as usual, the millionaires and the elite executive turned the town, or at least sections of it, into a pleasure resort with Cuban-style mansions, sumptuous brothels, a casino and even an English yacht club. A fire broke out in the refinery, allegedly organized by Stalin. The workers put out the fire, which meant that they were due, for this reason, due a bonus. That <coughs> management refused to pay the bonus because they knew that the fire was arson. Stalin called a strike, printed and distributed thousands of leaflets. The Rothschilds capitulated agreed to the workers' demand, including even a 30% pay increase. And this was, was considered a triumph, but the Rothschilds were determined to revenge their defeat. And this led to more upheavals, more arrests, more strikes for demonstrations. Eventually the army was called in, fired on the demonstration, killed 15 people. And the earlier strike and the massacre in Batumi, this one, brought Stalin to the attention of the Central Committee of the Social Democratic Party. Eventually, Stalin was arrested in Batumi, along with others, 
and he, while in prison, he converted it into a kind of university. He was, an, as I said before, an inexhaustible reader and teacher. Eventually, he was sent into exile in Siberia to Novaya Uda, 27 miles from Moscow, as the crow flies. He may now look idyllic in the pictures, but the temperatures in, 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 win, in the winter could easily, temperature could easily fall to 50 degrees below freezing. It was the first of several travels in his eight years of total, if intermittent, exile. Siberian exiles was, was considered one of the worst abuses of Tsarist tyranny. But once settled in, the, in some faraway village, the exiles, the intellectuals, often hereditary uh, noblemen, were usually well treated. Stalin traveled on a very low budget and lived in that Siberian village on a very low income. Books were shared, and in, if an exile died, the library was split between the survivors. Stalin was able to escape from this, his first exile, by taking advantage of, advantage of the fact that during the Christmas, Christmas Orthodox celebrations, the police assigned to watch over the exiles were parting, or maybe they just let him go. So he returned to Georgia. He befriended once more the, one of the families that knew, that knew, that knew him, the Alleluieva, uh, especially Olga, Olga the, with whom he had an affair and whose daughter, Nadia Alleluieva Stalin, would eventually marry. Svetlana, daughter of Nadia and of Stalin, describing her grandmother, says, often Olga fell in love with men. Then Stalin undertook a series of travels back and forth throughout Georgia, especially to the city of Kutazi, Kutaisi, where there was a strong revolutionary movement afloat. And this is the type of scenery you will find in Georgia, as the Caucasus mountains are even higher than the Alps. There, in this section of Georgia, Stalin was able to defeat the Mensheviks, the moderate, we would say today, the moderate, the moderate wing of the party. This event brought Stalin to the attention of Lenin, who was far away in St. Petersburg, for the first time. In the meantime, a disastrous war broke out between Russia and Japan in the east, and on January 2, 1905, Port Arthur on the Pacific Ocean surrendered to the Japanese. On Sunday, January 9, 1905, a crowd of 150,000 singing workers marched towards the Winter Palace in, in St. Petersburg, Petersburg to submit a humble and loyal petition to the Tsar. But the Cossacks blocked the way, the troops fired on the, fired on the crowd and then charged. 200 workers were killed and hundreds more wounded. And this was the bloodiest Sunday of Russia and it triggered demonstrations, ethnic massacres, killings, open revolution and strike all across, strikes all across the land. In Georgia, Stalin wrote on one of his revolutionary newspapers, workers of the Cau Caucasus, this is time for vengeance. Across the empire, Bolsheviks, Mensheviks and agitators all cooperated on the streets. Workers and soldiers created Soviets, can be means councils, the most famous was in, St. in Petersburg, and in turn the Tsar, planning vengeance, backed hypernationalistic death squads called the Black Hundred. There were more fights and more massacres. And at this time, Stalin traveled to Finland to meet Lenin for the first time. Lenin was a nobleman by birth and possessed, possessed the domineering personality of a nobleman. After his arrest and release, he moved to Western Europe where he wrote the book, what it titled What is to be done, which was to become a kind of gospel for the revolution. Stalin in between this revolutionary frenzy, found time to get married for the first time with Kato Svanitze. It was not an easy marriage, with Stalin always on the run, chased or escaping from police. His, his revolutionary activities brought him often to Baku, the oil extraction center, which was a hell city to live in, as opposed to today, which is a city of, of 200, 2 million people with skyscrapers, as you see, shaped at oil flames coming out of the ground, symbols of the city's fortune and prosperity. 
Stalin moved Kato or his wife Kato to Baku, where they lived in a modest shack near the Caspian Sea, with Stalin always on the run and running away from the police. After delivering her baby, called Yakov, Kato became ill. Stalin brought her back to Tiflis, but it was too late. And here is a picture of Kato just before her funeral. Stalin is on the far right. Tiflis was now dangerous for Stalin, and he returned to Baku. He would not see his newborn for 10 years, newborn son. By the way, I refer to him as Stalin, but this is an appellation that came much later, during the second and final phase of the 1917 revolution, as we will see shortly. The inspiration for the nickname Stalin is said to have derived, derived from one of his many girlfriends called Ludmila Stal, an experienced Bolshevik. His Georgian familiar name, as I said, was a Sozo, though he used other aliases as the situation required, as you see from this very long list. In Baku, <coughs> Stalin was eventually arrested again, and after a few months in prison, he was this time dispatched to another location for exiles, the European Vologda province, instead of the Asiatic Siberia in the village of Solvichegodosk, a medieval trading post. Here he found two mistresses, and one of them helped him escape. Once more, Stalin returned to Baku to reinvigorate the revolutionary force, and only to find that it was, this force was infiltrated with spies from the secret police. In this instance, Stalin assumed the nickname of the Milkman. And before, because in, the, in this co extremely confused pre-revolutionary times, sometimes revolutionaries were spies, and sometimes the spies were revolutionists, and many were double agents, and prison guards were also corruptible. Corruptible. So Stalin was arrested more once more, and then resented to the resent to the European Vologda, Vologda exile, where he escaped again in 1912. He traveled in disguise to Petersburg, where, with the help of a tycoon who donated 300,000 rubles, he, the famous newspaper Pravda was born, 1912. The paper was legal, but the editor-in-chief, Stalin, was not. So the Bolsheviks were on the run, betrayed, as I meant, perhaps mentioned before, by one of their prominent members, Malinovsky, who was a double agent and who informed the Okrana on, St on every step that Stalin took. Eventually, there was a fundraising ball of, of Bolshevik sympathizers, and Malinovsky insisted that Stalin participate. Stalin did, but he was arrested, was, was exiled once more in 1913 to four years, again in Siberia, in a place called Turukansk, which he reached in 26 days. From there, he was dispatched to an even remoter village called Kureika. In the village, there were altogether three families. He lived in one and managed to fall in love with, the, uh, with one of the sisters in another family, or better. He managed to seduce her as she was only 13 years old at the time. And he had she named the name by the name of Lydia Pereprigin. I hope I pronounce it well. Above the Arctic Circle's limits on these matters were more flexible. However, the policeman in charge of supervising, supervising Stalin's movement threatened criminal proceedings, but Stalin evaded the issue by promising that he would marry Lydia when she came of age. To complicate matters, Lydia became pregnant twice. The first child died soon after birth, but the second, Alexander, born in 1917, survived. Here is Lydia in the Middle Age with Stalin's son, Alexander. And in 1937, the secret police had Alexander sign a statement with, that he would never talk about his origins. Alexander became a postman, then an instructor. He fought in World War II, was wounded three times, was promoted to major. He married, he had three children, and died in 1987. One of his sons, called Yuri, says that his stepfather told him once that he was Stalin's grandson. Just one more reference, if you like, to Stalin's multiple, multiple flings. During another exile in his European Volvogtka, Volgotva uh, reason, he felt he flirted with a maid by the name of Pelaheya Onufrieva, 
uh, whom the secret police, which was following every, every step that Stalin took, co called her glamour puss. Uh, Stalin had another son by the landlady of, the, of his exile abode in Volvogna. And this son taught philosophy at the Le Leningrad University, fought in World War II, became a colonel, but after the war he was accused of being an American spy and was dismissed from the party. But after Stalin's death, he rejoined the party and became director of the Soviet television and culture industry. In the, in the, excuse me, culture ministry. Back to the main story. In 1917, <coughs> Imperial Russia needed all the troops it could spare for the war against Germany, World War I. Stalin was recalled from the exile, though he could not be heaven listed because early in his youth he had been run over by a horse-drawn carriage, speed cart, we would call it, called the Phaeton in Georgia. He was run over in Georgia and was left with a poorly functioning arm throughout his life. I must be concise here in the description of the intricate and dramatic events that occurred during the February Revolution of 1917 and then during the October Revolution of the same year, which saw the final victory of the Bolsheviks. On February, on February 26, 1917, 50 people were killed in fighting between the Petro, the St. Petersburg crowd and the Cossacks. But next day, the soldiers began to abandon the Tsar, who now no longer reigned. On March 2, 1917, the Tsar Nicholas, Nicholas II abdicated not in favor, in favor of his hemophiliac son, Alexei, but of his brother, the Grand Duke Michael. The new justice minister, by the name Kerensky, a name that I'm sure rings a bell, ordered all the deputies of the Duma, the government, those who had been exiled, released. So Stalin arrived in Petrograd carrying a small su suitcase and a typewriter. After the Tsar's abdication, Russia was no longer an empire, but it was neither a republic nor a monarchy. And at the time of the abdication of the two big wigs, the two big wigs of the two big wigs, big wigs, if you like, of the Bolshevik party, Trotsky and Lenin, they were, namely, Trotsky was in New York and Lenin in Switzerland. And finally, on March 27, 1917, Lenin boarded the famous seal, the train that brought him back to Russia. It is famous because in the ensuing months, Kerensky, who had become prime minister and leader of the provisional government, accused Lenin of having colluded with the Germans and of having been financially backed by Germany to cause Russia to sign the armistice in the World War in World War One. In June 17, Kerensky ordered an offensive against Germany that he hoped would boost the government's position, but it could turn out a disaster. Still, Kerensky also declared war on the Bolsheviks and set up to kill Lenin. Once more, Lenin had to escape, in this case to Finland, helped by a disguise personally arranged by Stalin, who shaved him and made him look like a Finnish, Finnish peasant. Meanwhile, Stalin was host in the house, in the household of the Alleluyevas, Alleluyev rather, family, one of whose do young daughters became Stalin's second wife and mother of his daughter Svetlana, who died in Wisconsin in 1911. Now, Russia's government was made, was made of three parties, the provisional government and the opposition, who was made up, which was made up of the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were divided among themselves about what to do next. Let's remember that it was not just a case of changing a government or deposing a Tsar, but Lenin planned a complete, complete, change, a model, complete change of the mode of life of society. And in a way, in a way the he planned it that he had never obtained before, certainly not on a scale as wide as, wide, as the widest nation of Earth, on Earth. In the instance, <coughs> it was Lenin, by, sheer f by if you like, sheer force of will, who drove the Bolsheviks to success in the October Revolution of 1917 that, as we know, changed the course of history. Four, at the beginning of the October, the central of October 17, the central committee was still divided among those who wanted the revolution and those who wanted to be in parliament as an opposition. In this case, Stalin sided with Lenin for the revolution. On October 25, Lenin was back from Finland when he reached the headquarters of the Bolsheviks, who had taken residence in the Smolde Institute that you see in the picture, built by Catherine the Great, 
As it often happens in, 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 in chaotic circumstances, everyone tries to do what he thinks is best, causing extreme confusion. The Bolsheviks took over the main post office, the electric, the electric power stations, various bridges, but the goal was to reach the Winter Palace, the seat of government. The palace was to be fired on from the Peter and Paul fortress, just across the river Neva, but there were only six guns available and only one was operative. And at 9.40 p.m. on, on uh, the 25th of October, a ship came up from the river. This crew were called converts to Bolshevism. They fired a blank, a blank shell to signal the beginning of the attack. In the palace, everybody ran away. And at the, finally, at about 2 a.m., Stalin, Lenin, Stalin and other Bolsheviks entered the Winter Palace. The troops found ample drinking material in the cellars that were stocked with the most exquisite, exquisite French and European vintage wines, which were the emperor's stock. And the next day, the 26th of October, the city was filled with the wildest excitement and confusion. At 8 p.m. of the next day, uh, the, uh, Lenin arrived at Winter Palace and said, we shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. In his memoirs, the foreign minister Molotov noted that Lenin, at the moment of the declaration, had a hole in his shoe. We should tell you something. Stalin, given his previous work on the business of nationalities, was named commissary, commissary of nationalities, but soon Lenin was advancing him as he valued his stubbornness, his firmness, and a certain shyness as quality necessaries necessary for the struggle. The enormous negative propaganda and actual war that the West declared against the Bolsheviks, to the point, as we know, that Bolshevik has been transformed into an insult, even more so than, say, fascist, that propaganda concealed an element of great, if you like, great irony. Europe, in the aftermath of World War I, was in a state of chaos and turmoil, followed later by the Great American de Depression and its worldwide equally depressing consequences. The discontent and the abyss between, to put it simply, between the haves and the haves rather, and the have-nots, left the have-nots on the point of starvation and despair, even in America. And it is ironic, as I said, that Franklin Roosevelt, when instituting those remedial measures that went into history under the name of the New Deal, including Social Security, unemployment benefits, etc., declared that he, by doing so he had saved capitalism. In the next episode, we will examine how Stalin's power consolidated the famous or infamous decade of the 30s, 1930s, and the dramatic developments that characterized those momentous years. Until then, I am Jimmy Moldia for Historical Sketches. Good night. Mm -hmm.